Morning, bon dia. I'm Jason Marzak, Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arsh Latin America Center. Benvenidos y obrigado por participar en esta importante conversa sobre democracia no Brasil. And I'll switch to English, but we remind everyone that we do have translation from English into Portuguese and Portuguese into English for, uh, throughout this conversation. Today, September 15th, is an incredibly symbolic day to be having this conversation. The world celebrates International Day of Democracy, resolved by the UN General Assembly in 2007 to promote and uphold democratic principles. However, since then, according to Freedom House, the world has experienced 16 consecutive years of democratic decline. As the title of today's conversation states, this global trend of questioning of democratic principles and even backsliding of democratic freedom in some places is incredibly, incredibly concerning. For Brazil, even with its incredibly strong institutions, the election and its aftermath present an opportunity to even further strengthen the overall democratic system amid global democratic headwinds. Today's discussion will shed light on the current state of Brazilian democracy ahead of consequential elections. Importantly, we also look at actionable responses and longer term policies to preserve and fortify democracy, which can be applicable for Brazil and further beyond. With the support of Action for Democracy, I also invite you to read our newest publication being launched today, titled Democratic Institutional Strength Ahead and Beyond Elections, The Case of Brazil. It's authored by my colleague, Valentina Sater, and it presents the product of a highly insightful private strategy session that we held here in July with senior Brazilian, US, and international experts, as well as former policymakers and practitioners of democracy. We'll hear from some of them directly today during this conversation of the next hour and a half. And we'll also hear from other experts in Brazil and from the international community. You can access this brief in the Zoom chat for those joining us via Zoom. And we also invite you to follow the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag ACBrazil. And you can also use that to send in questions during today's conversation. I'd now like to pass it to David Karani, the board president executive director of Action for Democracy, and also a former Atlantic Council colleague and also thank him for his support and partnership of this project. I'd also like to take a moment to also thank the Brazilian Center for International Relations, SEBRI, for their institutional partnership. David, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Jason. Uh, it's good to be back, it's good to be home. Uh, this was my home for six years, uh, and it's just a fantastic feeling to, to be back again. Uh, as uh, some of you know, I'm Hungarian, and you might ask, what is a Hungarian doing trying to sustain or help sustain Brazilian democracy? Well, it's a fair question. Uh, and despite the distance and the many differences between the two countries, uh, there are also many similarities. The democratic journey for both of our countries resumed in the late 1980s. Uh, and in both of our countries, democratic institutions, checks and balances, the rule of law, recently faced some serious challenges, if not existential attacks. And this is not only true in Brazil and Hungary, as Jason outlined, but it's in many other democracies in the world. And indeed, this is why we established Action for Democracy, uh, to help counter this rising threat on a global scale. Because these are not isolated tendencies, but they are closely connected and they reinforce each other. And increasingly on the institutional, personal, and even financial level. Thus, we cannot really be effective in fighting back if we are fragmented ourselves. So Action for Democracy, for that reason, is building a global grassroots solidarity movement to help reinforce pro-democracy actors on the ground in what we call battleground states. Battleground states, there are countries, due to their size, regional importance, or for some other reason, key for uh, the global democracy, the global struggle for democracy. And these are countries such as Poland, such as Hungary, such as Turkey, such as Brazil, of course. Uh, with the help of our community, we support frontline democratic organizations and advocate for robust pro-democracy policies in key capitals such as Washington, DC. And although we are a young organization, we are very honored to have an advisory council that consists of household na names in uh, the global democracy promotion, people like Anne Applebaum, Kathy Martin, Francis Fukuyama, Timothy Snyder, Timothy Garton-Ash, or David Miliband. So 
to finish up, Brazil undoubtedly is a key piece in the global democratic puzzle. And how Brazil goes will have a major impact on whether democracy thrives or fails in the continent and beyond, not to mention the ability on our, on the impact on our ability to tackle major global challenges such as climate change. And we have been honored and we were very excited to help facilitate this dialogue together with the Atlantic Council and we were very happy to support the report as well. So thank you, Jason, and thank you for the Council for the partnership. Thank, thanks so much, David, and, and great to, as you said, great to have you back, back here at home uh, in, the, uh, in the new Atlantic Council studios. And also a special welcome to our uh, in-studio audience as well. Thanks for uh, joining us here in person as well as all those here uh, joining us virtually. Now, for the first part of the conversation, I'd like to welcome four uh, fantastic speakers, uh, Ambassador uh, Anthony Harrington, uh, Miriam Kornbluth is here to my side, uh, Nick Zimmerman and Patricia Campos Mellon. We'll talk about global uh, democratic challenges and how countries and democratic institutions can be proactive and further strengthen their democracy given the many global challenges and global democratic headwinds we're seeing. I'm going to go ahead and just briefly introduce our speakers. Uh, joining us uh, via video, Ambassador Harrington is Managing Board Chair at Albright Stonebridge Group, where he leads the group's America's practice. Uh, during the Clinton administration, he also served as U.S. Ambassador to Brazil, uh, among the many other posts that he has had. So, Tony, great to have you join us today. Sitting to my side here is uh, Miriam Kornbluth. Miriam, great to have you here in studio. Miriam is the uh, Senior Director for Latin America and the Caribbean at the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, she uh, is, works at an organization, incredible organization, uh, that supports and advocates for freedom, democracy all across the world. Miriam, great to have you here today. Thank you. It's great. Also joining uh, via video is uh, Nick Zimmerman. Uh, Nick is a global fellow at the Wilson Center's Brazil Institute and also a senior advisor at West Eck Advisors. Uh, he also served as director for Brazil and Southern Cone Affairs at the NSC. Nick, great to have you here today. Uh, we're also joined by Patricia Campos Mello. Patricia is a senior fellow with the Brazilian Center for International Relations, uh, SEBRI, and a special reporter and columnist at the Brazilian newspaper Foja de Sao Paulo. Patricia, good morning. Great to have you, too. Uh, I also want to, before we go ahead and get started, I want to give also a special thank you to Miriam and Patricia, who are both acknowledged in the policy brief that we are, being, that we are launching today uh, for their support and contributions to that, to that effort. Uh, Tony, I'm going to go ahead and start with you. Um, you and I have talked about how democracy is under strain worldwide. I'd like to have you start off by explaining what you see as some of the factors that can explain some of the recent challenges that democracy has faced globally, and also how did these factors come about? Thank you, Jason, and uh, congratulations to uh, the Adrian Arcs Center and the Atlantic Council overall for the priority attention you're giving to the major concern for preserving, strengthening uh, democracy in Brazil uh, and uh, uh, ultimately beyond. As you noted, I was privileged to represent the U.S. and uh, Brazil and what I would have to say were better times there and here. Uh, enhanced by serving with the great uh, Fernando Henrique Cardozo as president, uh, uh, really extraordinary leader, scholar, and public servant, uh, and uh, enjoyed uh, the benefits of a close personal relationship between uh, Presidents Cardozo and Clinton and their distinguished spouses. Um, the troubled global landscape uh, that you referred to, Jason, um, it uh, uh, seemed a little like a perfect storm, although perfect has never sounded like the right adjective for storms. Um, Doesn't. Um, <clears throat> just to, we're all quite, quite aware of uh, the factors, I think, but just to reflect on them a bit. Uh, we have an unexpected and devastating war underway with uh, uh, devastating consequences for the battleground, but uh, also devastating consequences rippling out from it. We had, um, we have uh, 
uh, an anticipated pandemic uh, that has uh, uprooted normal uh, conduct of business and exchange and so forth. Uh, I think we're all observing uh, increased polarization around the world. Uh, and, and in this case, not just Brazil, but so we're seeing it here at home in the US. Uh, increasing presence of autocrats, uh, autocratic uh, leaders. Uh, some of you uh, will remember, and hopefully some have read uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Secretary Albright's, I uh, can't remember if it was our last book, but one of our last books, Fascism, A Warning, mm -hmm. which uh, at the time was really quite uh, prophetic uh, in thinking about uh, what uh, would or could come. Um, then all of this uh, has produced a combination of cultural alienation, I think, uh, personal alienation, uh, uh, but also associated economic challenges, uh, especially as we hear so much uh, inflation and the cost of living. Um, and then uh, sort of an overlay of all of this on the global stage of the world, uh, climate as an existential threat. Uh, I, I'm increasingly worried on the one hand about the effects of climate on uh, the planet and uh, uh, my grandkids. Uh, but uh, also uh, increasingly thinking that uh, recent devastating climate events are beginning to rally uh, leaders and uh, citizens to realize we have to take serious steps and uh, are on the on the march to do so. So Tony, Tony, I'm going to go ahead and jump in there. So there's uh, war, polarization, autocracy, economic challenges. Uh, climate, uh, we're doing a lot of work here through our Adrian Arsh Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center on heat and uh, paying attention to extreme heat. You also make a really important point about alienation, uh, cultural uh, alienation, personal alienation, and how that has been uh, fomented even more so by the communication channels in which uh, people receive and share information these days. Yeah. We have... Uh, we have really the, these multiple factors that are coming at uh, democracies. I mentioned the statistic in the beginning from, from Freedom House. And, and Miriam, um, you, you, you obviously know the case of Brazil really well, but uh, at Ned, you're looking all across democracies around the world. What do you see as some of the similarities, some of the differences as well between the challenges that in democracy that Brazil is facing, as other countries are, are facing, and Brazil in particular as it's uh, coming into an election uh, in a few weeks, but also those, those similarities with other cases that you might be seeing, whether it's in the Americas, uh, Europe, Asia, Africa. What are, uh, is Brazil, is, is some of the challenges Brazil is facing in, uh, right now, is that uh, similar to what, you're, what Ned is seeing in other parts of the world, or is it slightly different in the, in the Brazilian case? Yeah, thank you, Jason. Uh, uh, again, it's a, it's a pleasure for be, uh, to be here. Um, well, obviously, Brazil is very unique, but on the other hand, Brazil shares a lot of uh, common uh, trends that have already been described by Ambassador Harrington and yourself. Uh, I would say that some uh, Brazil has a very strong democracy indeed. It, had, it fought fi hard to, to gain this democracy after a very difficult uh, history and has strong institutions. However, uh, we've seen in the past decade, and that's been reported by Freedom House, uh, a decay in some indicators, relevant indicators. Um, there was uh, you know, pretty, uh, say, uh, recognition, a strong recognition of the strength of the judiciary in Brazil, the way it dealt with the Lava Jato the scandal. However, We've also seen, most recently, a hyper-politization of the judiciary, yeah. which is a very worrisome trend in regards to the strength of democracy. Uh, on the other hand, Brazil has a strong uh, party system, and globally we've seen, we are seeing how party systems and parties are 
falling apart or they're unable to really channel uh, people's uh, interests and desires and represent adequately people, but that party system too is, is weakening. Brazil has a highly decentralized system which can be very uh, positive, but this hyper-decentralization is also generating a lot of difficulty to reach agreements. Yeah. There are uh, lots of uh, partial agreements at local level uh, and uh, state level, which are also creating pockets of uh, clientelism and uh, opportunities for corruption. Yeah. So those are, I would say, uh, some very particular, uh, uh, say, challenges that Brazil faces. And in addition to that, something that's pretty global, the uh, increase in polarization, a very contaminated digital space. Mm -hmm. There's also a growth in what we call identity politics mm -hmm. that also uh, you know, presents challenges in terms of uh, aggregating um, interests and channeling uh, these, uh, say, uh, societal uh, choices. And unfortunately, in the last uh, couple of years, we have seen uh, an attempt to delegitimize the electoral system, which is increasing, it's incredibly strong, but that kind of discourse can have a very deleterious effect, as we have seen here in, in the U.S. and elsewhere. So. They are, Brazil shares some common traits and, and also has its own specificities that make us and Brazilians uh, be concerned about the, uh, the future and the strength of democracy yeah, in the country. Yeah. I mean, there, there's, there's global trends uh, from, I mean, I'll call them the anti-democratic crusaders uh, that you see in countries around the world. The, uh, as you mentioned, the uh, questioning of political parties, the, the questioning of the system, uh, the way in which information is received or, or, or transmitted, but of course, as you mentioned, the, the particularities, particular challenges that Brazil faces within this broader uh, global context. Uh, Nick, uh, Miriam uh, mentioned the United States, and of course, we can't talk about democracy and, and uh, questioning of the democratic system and threats to democracy without, uh, being rec without recognizing the own challenges that we have in, in this country. Um, what do you see as some of the shared challenges for democracy between our two countries, and, and also not just challenges, but I always like to look in the future. What, what can we learn from each other? Uh, what, can, what can both the U.S. and Brazil be learning from, from these, these shared global challenges, of course, taking into account the specificity of the Brazil case, uh, as, as democracies are being you know, questioned globally? Sure. Uh, thank you for the invite, Jason, and, and the question. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Um, I've enjoyed working with you uh, over the years and have missed the opportunity to do so in these pandemic times. I think, quite simply and broadly, the challenges and opportunities are both vast. Um, we're talking about two of the world's five largest democracies. Uh, so if we are going to see some sort of a coordinated um, global campaign to take this issue set on um, and have a multilateral component to it, I think for any such effort to have any chances of success, you need to have Washington and Brasilia at the table um, because of influence, because of size, because of the vibrancy of both country's democratic institutions and the threats that they face, some of which are very similar, some of which are distinct to their own political realities. Um, in many ways, relative to my time serving in, in government several years ago, uh, there are, of course, through lines, but the context is very new. Um, the polarization that, that has so deeply marked the political discourse and in both countries was really just kicking off uh, while I was in government. And I think it's radically reshaped bilateral dynamics, um, mostly in a challenging way up until now, but also to your point, I think it opens up um, some opportunities if, if we're looking over the midterm horizon for, for new areas of collaboration, democracy obviously being one of them, but I think Uh, we lost Nick's sound. Nick, 
Nick, we lost your you lost your sound as we're as we're working on that. I'm going to move on to uh, to Patricia. Um, Patricia, um, one of the factors that we were talking about uh, with uh, Tony and Miriam and and Nick got to this as well is the um, is how the the media has been impacted uh, as well by this growing wave of of democracy being under assault. In what ways do you see that journalists, civil society actors, and, and others have shown kind of resilience in this context? Well, thank you. I would like to thank uh, Action for Democracy and the Atlantic Council for uh, having this conversation. Um, I think more than the effects on uh, journalists and on civil society, there's an effect on the information ecosystem in Brazil. Uh, what we are seeing here uh, on, the, on the ground is basically uh, the polls uh, indicate that it's going to be a very tight election, even though there was hope that it could be resolved uh, in the first round, that is not a very high uh, probability. And this is actually perfect for uh, the coming storm that we are foreseeing, which is uh, disputing the results of the election. Uh, we have at the same time attacks against uh, mainstream respected polling institutes, uh, against uh, the mainstream media and the civil society, and all to develop this narrative that actually the polling institutes are um, either wrong or hyper-partisan. That's why they do not uh, have uh, President Bolsonaro leading the polls. Uh, the media is, of course, uh, uh, also uh, lying, and the civil society also wants to undermine uh, the will of the people. So um, I think the biggest challenge for the media uh, and, and for civil society is um, how are we going to maintain, uh, uh, actually, how are we going to face if there's civic unrest, which there is a, a high possible probability that that, that is going to happen, because for a part of the population, uh, President Bolsonaro is leading uh, in the polls and he should win in the first round. And if he does not, that is the proof that uh, the elections have been rigged. Uh, so um, this is a very, uh, it's not the majority of the population, but as you guys know, you have seen, it's uh, really enough to cause a lot of unrest. Uh, and also, regardless of the results of the elections, we might end up with a big portion of the population, just like in the U.S., I guess, what, 70 percent of the Republicans who do not believe that the election results uh, were legitimate in 2020. We might also end up with a part of the population uh, also not trusting the system and trusting the institutions. And how do we either, uh, I mean, whoever wins the election, how is this person going to govern uh, with a part of the population not believing in the institutions? I think this is a big challenge, Jason. You know, and Patricia, this, this is a challenge that we're seeing globally, right? I mean, this is a challenge. I mean, this is, this is a, a trend of, of, you mentioned the U.S. case, but there's other cases around the world of, of the, the population not necessarily believing in the results of the electoral authorities. And so how, do, how does a leader govern uh, in, that, uh, in that dynamic? Uh, I want to... Um, uh, I want to go back to, uh, uh, to, to Miriam. Miriam, in the uh, 2021 Latino Barometer Survey, a uh, member of Latin American countries reported that anywhere between 30 to 40 percent of citizens were indifferent. They were indifferent as to whether uh, they prefer living in a democracy or a dictatorship. Uh, part of that goes to just wanting to have a government that delivers for their basic needs, regardless of what type of government it is. What explains, from your perspective, authoritarianism's increasing allure, and, and what are some of the selling points um, for democracy uh, in, this, in this moment of discontent that we can further, further build upon that, uh, uh, in, this, in this moment? Yeah, that's a, that's a difficult question, <laughs> uh, Jason. Um, well, of course, that, I mean, we need to read those, those, those answers and also understand that for many, democracy is a given. So uh, it's easy to say we would prefer something else that is you know, better or de delivers better, whether it's called uh, authoritarianism or something else. I think that it, what's, what it's really expressing is the desire to have a better system, maybe not necessarily an authoritarian system, but something that's different because nowadays democracy has been 
uh, identified with uh, failures and efficiencies, but there's also a very worrisome uh, aspect of to, to, that, uh, to those kind of answers, which is for some, there is a clear preference for a non-democratic regime. And that, I think, it's, uh, it's the result of all the trends that we have been discussing so far, uh, very uh, misinformation, uh, lack of information, a very polluted uh, digital space, the allure that many uh, uh, individuals, uh, you know, uh, populist uh, leaders are uh, are having the the debacle of yeah. uh, of, of uh, political so, systems that are not providing yeah. not providing the the answers. So what, what what's the step forward then? What do we do? What do we do? I about think that? I mean first uh, I think we have to go basically back to basics in the sense of uh, reinforcing the 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 connection between uh, access to basic goods and services through uh, a regime that allows for contestation, for feedback, for knowledge, for accountability, because without those elements, I mean, no, there's no possibility that a, a authoritarian regime will deliver for the people, and that's, that's the case for Latin America. And I think uh, civil society in this case plays a huge role for, uh, addressing the different aspects of democracy and highlighting them and giving, giving them visibility and bringing, bringing them to the discussion, to the public discussion. Because we know maybe political figures have lost a lot of their leg legitimacy, but in the case of Latin America, la uh, civil society has a strong uh, yeah. legitimacy, and I think that's, that's an asp a dynamic aspect of the region that needs to be uh, so taken into account and encourage more. You know, that firsthand from all the great work that Ned does with civil <laughs> society around the region, you know, it's, it's all about democracy, showing that democracy is, is, has been talked about in the U.S., democracy delivers, and showing that democracy delivers, uh, we're looking globally, regionally, but things like the Alliance for Development Democracy between post Costa Rica, Panama, Dominican Republic, now Ecuador, really focused on how democracies can work together to solve concrete problems, concrete challenges that a citizenry faces. Uh, I'm going to go back to Tony in a moment, but first, uh, Nick, you were, um, your audio stopped working before, and so let me, I see you're back on. Let me, let me go back to you to allow you to finish your point on, on U.S., Brazil, and, and shared, shared uh, lessons learned. Thanks, Jason, and my apologies for the audio. I, I, I think it's the casualty of being the son of a philosophy professor of technology always bedevils me. Uh, at a high level, I think that there are a number of challenges and opportunities in the relationship, and in many ways, uh, I think that there are both more opportunities and more challenges given the polarized uh, political environment that Brazil, the United States, and, and countries really around the world are facing. Um, figuring out how we can work together to, um, as Miriam was just alluding in yourself, how to make democracy deliver better use technology, innovation, up our game on services delivery, I think is a ripe area for, for discussion and, and collaboration, um, how to break through some of the barriers that countries such as the United States have been facing in terms of um, delivering again, um, kind of, you know, the possibilities of socioeconomic mobility that characterize past decades of economic life in the United States, and for that matter, in, in Brazil, and the not too far distant past as, as well. Other areas like Climate change, the challenge itself has only become more pressing since since I left government. Um, Brazil and the United States had started to lead on these issues and then run up to Paris. I think that as the problem has only gotten worse, um, as we've just witnessed in the United States over our summer, and as we continue to see record rates of deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon and other um, geographically significant regions of Brazil beyond just the, the its Amazon basin, um, I think there's a, a new energy and willingness to, to work on these issues together as well. Um, and of course, in polarized times, um, with sides talking past each other, um, with a, in a new era of rising great power competition, um, I think there'll be new tensions uh, as well. And frankly, none of that is particularly surprising, and even if the details are specific to, to the time. Again, when you're talking about two of the five largest democracies in the world, there are going to be a lot of points of common interest and a lot of divergences, uh, as there are in Washington's relationships with 
some of the other largest countries uh, in the world. So I'll stop there. Uh, thanks, Nick. That's really helpful. Uh, and I want to remind everybody uh, watching via Zoom, if you have a question, feel free to put it in the Zoom chat and, and we'll get it over to, to me or to uh, Valentina in the next panel. And if you're here in the in-studio audience, uh, you can also write your question down and it'll, it'll get to me as, as well. Uh, Tony, uh, Nick talked about uh, uh, innovation. We got to innovate the way that we work as, as, uh, as democracies and, and especially with the many global challenges that we've been, we've been discussing. Uh, uh, Miriam as well, and talking about the, the importance of democracy and showing that, that, that it works, that it's really the right, that's the correct system for, for people's needs. Uh, Brazil is cited as oftentimes as a, a model of democratic resilience and reconstruction, Tony, particularly after the military dictatorship ended in the 80s and the electoral system is also renowned worldwide. From your perspective, what are some of the institutional innovations in Brazil that the world can learn from? Uh, and also, what are some of the ways in which Brazil um, could further, even further lead in, in democratic innovation. Get off mute here. Um, yes, there's more than a little irony involved in uh, the situation that we're discussing and facing. Um, the uh, electoral system in Brazil and has, has been for a few years now a cited as a model worldwide uh, for uh, a modern and reliable uh, electoral process. Uh, and uh, fortunately, recent polling has indicated that the majority of Brazilians trust the election, uh, the election process. <clears throat> so um uh, it uh hopefully the trust will prevail um and as we've seen brazilian uh, democracy has emerged from the military dictatorship and uh, had peaceful transitions of power uh election after election uh and even with two impeachments of uh, Brazilian presidents. Uh, they, they've gone, the uh, orderly transfer of power has gone forward. Um, and in fact, the constitutional process in Brazil, the Brazilian constitution is pretty complicated, but the constitutional process uh, related to elections is simpler than our own here in, in the US as we have unfortunately seen uh, too, too up close. Uh, but uh, apart from the constitutional order, uh, uh, we have seen uh, Brazilians uh, speaking out, civil society, business, uh, uh, and finance. Uh, so uh, as, as people have probably heard, seen, observed. Uh, early on, there was a statement by 3,000 leading business and financial uh, uh, principles uh, regarding the importance of democracy in Brazil and avoidance of a rupture uh, in conjunction with the elections underway. Uh, Organizations uh, such as SEBRI uh, participating here uh, today, uh, Federation of Industry of Sao Paulo, the largest uh, by far state uh, uh, industry association and Febrabon uh, also have uh, spoken out. And then there was a a uh, letter on to which uh, close to a million uh, persons signed, I believe, including the great Fernando and Hiki Cardoso uh, as, as one of those signatories. So um, uh, things are, are working. Uh, and in terms of the three powers, uh, the courts, both the Supreme Court and the Electoral Court uh, 
unfortunately, there's been a politicization, as uh, Miriam, I think, noted, uh, of the judicial process. But nevertheless, uh, the courts have risen to the test. Uh, it's kind of reaching places that you would hope they wouldn't yeah. need uh, to go or be, uh, uh, but providing leadership and institutional strength that is needed. There's a rather assertive Congress in Brazil, uh, and it's not going anywhere. It's going to be there after the election. Uh, whoever wins will uh, find uh, some challenge to that important relationship. So uh, ultimately, uh, I think we have to count on the good people of Brazil who will be uh, casting their votes. Uh, and it seems that, uh, again, according to the polling, the younger citizens and the older citizens uh, are more concerned than those in the middle. Uh, so uh, I think it's always good news when younger voters are concerned and thus uh, inspired to do what they can to preserve democratic order. Tony, those are uh, really, really important yeah. points. I, I want to, um, I'm, um, I, we have to move, move on soon to the, to the next yeah. panel, but I want, I want to mention two things just to end that, that come out in the policy brief a couple of the recommendations in the policy brief that we uh, have uh, launched today. Uh, one of them is the importance of the international community. Uh, Tony, you were, you were talking, I was asking as well about uh, the innovations from the Brazilian democratic system and the strength and the resilience of the Brazilian democracy and the Brazilian electoral system, which you were uh, speaking about as well, how, how strong and, how, how, and its credibility. Uh, one of those recommendations is the fact that the international community should immediately come out and recognize the uh, uh, the results that are put out there by the uh, electoral system, so there isn't kind of murkiness and 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 who is whether the results are, are agreed to or not, and and, uh, um, and and as well the an idea of looking even further about potentially the idea of establishment of a U.S. Brazil uh, dialogue on democracy promotion, given some of the conversation we were having earlier. Nick, you were talking about this as well. The the, the shared challenges that that we have, and also the opportunities to learn from each other. Uh, Patricia, you're. You're joining us from Brazil. What do, you, what do you think about some of these ideas? I think the idea of uh, recognizing the results uh, right away, it's actually an excellent idea, and it would be really helpful in terms of uh, helping support the electoral authorities in, in Brazil and, and helping with a counter-narrative if we do have uh, you know, contested results. Uh, so I think this this would be really important. And I think the U.S. Um, government, they have been sort of, uh, you know, uh, verbalizing this message after the meeting in uh, July when President Bolsonaro convened all, like, several ambassadors in Brasilia. Uh, in a few hours, uh, the U.S. embassy and several other embassies said, you know, we trust uh, electoral systems in Brazil. Uh, ele elections have been uh, clean and, and trustworthy for many, many years. And I think th this movement uh, of the international community and mainly uh, the U.S. government is very helpful to uh, Brazilian institutions in, in such a fragile moment that we are living. I, I agree, Patricia. You're looking at uh, there's uh, always a, a, a challenge in trying to put the U.S. on the wrong side or the wrong footing before a major uh, election. And the U.S. government has been doing an incredible job in navigating the the, the, uh, the uh, uh, potential treacherous waters and, and but being very firm and clear on the importance of the of the electoral system and the and the in the, uh, the belief and the strength of the of the electoral system which is uh, of course the right message Miriam you're, you're here with me in studio so I'll give you an opportunity to have a, a final comment on some of the ideas we, we uh, uh, you you were also uh, participated in and some of the ideas behind the uh, policy brief we launched today. Um, also, maybe the idea of the U.S.-Brazil um, uh, dialogue on democracy promotion. How do you see something like that potentially transpiring? Yeah, well, um, what can I say? I think the title of this uh, conversation is Looking at the Elections and Beyond, uh, something along those lines. And I think, of course, Brazil is facing a, a risky moment. I mean, we all know that there have been attempts to undermine the credibility of the elections, and that entails many risks in terms of 
recognizing the results, and you know the sequence is pretty well known, and it, it can be dangerous. But uh, assuming that that could be overcome well, and whoever wins, I think we need we still need to look at uh, challenges ahead. Uh, Brazil has gone through a difficult period in this at least this past ten years. Uh, there have been, uh, I mean. Institutions have suffered from these difficult periods, um, a lot of political turmoil, a lot of uh, uh, real significant corruption scandals, the breakdown of the party system. So uh, beyond the elections, <coughs> without overlooking the relevance of these elections, there is uh, a lot of uh, concern in terms or a lot of need for attention beyond elections. And I think the US-Brazil uh, partnership and partnership among democracies, I think that's the, the message, message that David uh, presented at the, with his initial remarks. I mean, yeah. democracies globally, and particularly in the Americas, need to coalesce, need to find common ground, need to recognize the threats against democracy and the clear decline of democracy globally and we need to coalesce and raise the, the, the allure, the, the relevance, and also the ability of democracies to deliver properly because <coughs> that's part of the problem. Yeah. Well, hopefully with all the attention that, that we at the Atlantic Council and, and, and others are placing on the importance of democracy in, in Brazil's uh, democratic institutions, that will have a, a uh, um, an election that's um, that's uh, uh, respected by all parties, respected by the electorate, that goes uh, that's, that's peaceful as, as well, and but that we also use this moment of of, uh, of focusing on Brazil to look even longer term, which is which is so pivotal uh, uh, moving into 2023 as we continue to face these global democratic. Uh, headwinds. We can, of course, continue the conversation, but we have a second fantastic group of speakers that will be coming up. I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Tony Harrington uh, uh, for joining us, Nick Zimmerman, Patricia. Uh, Miriam, thank you so much for joining us here in studio. And now I want to turn it over to my Jason, colleague. could I add one note? Sure. Uh, yeah. One quick note. I just want to recognize Action for Democracy, uh, David Karanyu and his colleagues uh, for the the, the word action in their name is reflected in their conduct. They're very action oriented and uh, collaborating with the Atlantic Council and beyond. Uh, they're making a, a real contribution, including uh, having a couple of great colleagues spending time on the ground in Brazil. Th thanks, thanks, Tony. Yes, uh, it's always it's great to work. Uh, uh, with uh, Action for Democracy. I've been trying to find ways to work with David over the years, uh, uh, given the different regional focus, and glad we can come together uh, on, uh, on, uh, at, this, at this incredibly important moment. So uh, with that, let me turn over to Valentina Sater, uh, Associate Director uh, at the Adrian R. Latin America Center, and also who leads our work on Brazil, and she'll continue the conversation. Over to you, Valentina. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, everyone, for this insightful conversation. Um, we are going to continue this conversation with now focusing and going deeper into Brazil. Um, with that, so we can actually talk about these Brazil issues, I also wanted to um, introduce everyone here. Um, we are joined by an amazing lineup of speakers and experts. Feliciano Guimarães is the academic director and senior researcher at the Brazilian Center for International Relations, SEBRI, um, and an associate professor at the Institute of International Relations at the University of Sao Paulo, USP. Welcome, Feliciano. Thank you again to Sebri for the institutional partnership. I also wanted to welcome Dr. Renata Gil. She is the president of the Association of Bra Brazilian Magistrates, joining us here as well. Um, Bruno Brandão is the executive director of Transparency International Brazil. Thank you, Bruno, for joining us. And last but not least, um, Alana Hizu. Um, she is the co-founder of Regis Cordiais and the public policy manager at YouTube Bra Brazil. Um, welcome, Feliciano, Renata, Alana, Bruno. Um, I also invite those um, joining us via Zoom, as well as those in our studio audience, to submit their questions um, in the chat option on Zoom or via the hashtag ACBrazil on Twitter. 
um, we'll be taking questions if we have time, because I have lots of questions myself. So without further ado, let me begin with Feliciano. Feliciano, the conversation that we had previously already touched on some of these issues, but I wanted to bring it back to the case of Brazil specifically. Um, as we know, there has been increasingly questions over the resilience of Brazilian democracy and the democratic system, um, and as we mentioned in the previous conversation. Amid global democratic challenges that we were just discussing, how would you evaluate the strength of Brazilian democracy right now? Um, and please provide, if you can, a couple examples of how um, it's been shown resilient and, and also how it could be improved. I believe you're on mute, Feliciano. <laughs> oh, I forgot something, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Valentina. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before I move on to the to answer your question, I'd like just to say that it's a great pleasure to be here, to be part of this discussion. On behalf of SABRI, I would like to thank the Atlantic Council for its long-standing collaboration with us and Action uh, for Democracy for organizing these panels. And I also would like to, to give a special thank to Valentina Seder for her work on the discussions about the Brazilian democracy in the Atlantic Council. Although SEBRI has always focused, uh, focused its attention on international relations and foreign policy more recently, and for obvious reasons, the center is also discussing issues concerning the quality and endurance of the of Brazil young democratic system and its relationship with foreign policy. So I think uh, the parts that I'm going to try to answer from uh, Valentina's uh, question is the global challenge of democracy and how we can think about Brazil's place in the world and Brazil's foreign policy. Uh, of Bolsonaro and also if Lula gets elected, Lula's foreign policy and how the foreign policy can affect uh, the, the, Brazil, the quality of Brazilian democracy, right? Uh, so uh, how, can we, how can the foreign policy be used to weaken or improve Brazil's democratic system, something that we have been seeing in uh, Bolsonaro's uh, administration? Uh, uh, so if Bolsonaro wins, uh, the, the, the foreign policy will continue to be uh, used uh, to strengthen and expand its uh, his domestic support base, right? More than just achieving foreign policy gains abroad, Bolsonaro's foreign policy is predominantly focused on the domestic political logic of confronting uh, his opponents. For Bolsonaro, the foreign policy is an instrument to attack national democratic institutions. For Bolsonaristas, there is a big clash in the world between conservative regimes and globalist regimes. It is not just a matter between democracies and authoritarian regimes. On the contrary, for them, national identities and values are more important than the shape of political institutions. In this sense, the foreign policy needs to be at the service of this great spiritual struggle for the expansion of conservative values and eventually to implement an entire regime in Brazil in the shape of Putin's uh, Russia. The narrative of warriors of liberty fighting against Brazil's corrupted elite is just a facade for the hidden goal goal of eliminating globalist and leftist opponents in Brazil. Now, if Lula wins, the foreign policy has a different operating logic. Uh, in the place of Brazil and the world will also be different. If Lula is elected, foreign policy will be an instrument for restoring Brazil's international credibility and maintaining Brazil's democratic institutions. But for Lula, the international level also works to satisfy domestic demands, but from a different point of departure. In my view, Lula's foreign policy in, his, uh, in the next administration, if he wins, will probably seek international agreements and partnerships that increase the cost of any coup or any future attacks on Brazilian democratic institutions. That is, Lula's number one task will be to use Brazil's foreign policy not only to restore the country's credibility on issues such as environment or human rights, but also to assess how internet, Brazil's international action can isolate and penalize Bolsonaro's supporters domestically. In the Workers' Party's view, the foreign policy is likely to serve to create networks of agreements and partnerships that isolate and weaken Bolsonaristas with a view of the 2026 election. So to summarize and to see what the place of Brazil uh, uh, and this global struggle for democracy and how can we think of instruments to in, uh, improve uh, the quality of democracy in Brazil, I, see, I think that the foreign policy of the next administration, whether it's Bolsonaro or Lula, will be a key aspect uh, of how to uh, understand the, the, the democracy can survive in Brazil. As anyone can see, the, this upcoming election is far from solving Brazil's enduring rivalry between the two political groups that are destined to clash for many years to come. But the country's foreign policy is just one pawn on this chessboard that put Brazil's democracy in 
the role. So I don't know if I answer your question, but the idea is that <laughs> in order to understand how democracy will operate in Brazil in the next coming years, whether Bolsonaro or Lula wins, the foreign policy and how Brazil uh, relates itself with other countries, whether it's democratic countries or authoritarian regimes abroad, will be a key aspect since both, both candidates will likely use the foreign policy to strengthen their position domestically. So thank you. I give the word back to you. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you, Feliciano. That's a very interesting point of view in terms of how foreign policy is also being used um, in terms of strengthening democracy in Brazil, as well as um, in terms in the other way around, which is what we also think about and propose during this conversation, as well as in the issue brief that we are launching today, how the international community can also support and further support Brazil in its efforts to strengthen its own uh, democratic institutions. With that, Renata, I wanted to turn it to you. Um, as Miriam was actually mentioning um, earlier, we had this, the conversation today is focused on the elections, but also beyond the elections. And the focus of the issue brief is also in that sense, looking ahead beyond the elections on what Brazil can do now, as well as beyond these elections to strengthen its institutions. For many years and recently, we've been seeing and hearing that Brazil is facing an institutional crisis. Um, I think that my question to you as a representative of the judiciary is wondering how can the judiciary, what's the role of the judiciary in ensuring this balance of power and also ensuring that we have a smooth um, electoral period um, ahead of us and then beyond um, once we do have um, the next president, whoever that might be? Então, primeiro eu queria agradecer ao Atlantic Council o convite, dizer que esse tema é muito pertinente, muito importante para nós do Judiciário nesse momento, em que a gente busca exatamente mostrar para a população brasileira que o Judiciário é forte, especialmente o Judiciário Eleitoral, que no Brasil tem essa condição de realizar né, o processo eleitoral brasileiro. Quero cumprimentar aí todos os meus colegas de mesa, pessoas importantes e que têm nos ajudado a passar essa mensagem é, para a população brasileira. É, eu acho que tudo que a gente discute em termos de democracia tem que perpassar primeiro pelo fortalecimento do judiciário e da independência judicial. Todos os retrocessos democráticos que a gente está vivendo e vendo também no mundo, é, eles têm muita relação com a atuação judicial na manutenção das democracias, né? E, e o nosso papel é, como foi dito no, no bloco anterior, é um papel para esse momento e um papel para o momento posterior. A polarização, ela infelizmente, ela não se encerra quando a eleição termina. Né? A gente ainda vai ter um, um resquício muito forte é, dessa polarização, quem quer que seja é, o eleito, é, em, talvez em menor ou, ou maior grau, de acordo com quem né, for eleito e conseguir assumir aí esse legado pós-eleitoral. Eu tenho plena convicção que, com relação às institui instituições brasileiras, elas estão muito fortes e bem organizadas. Tanto é assim que inúmeros processos legislativos foram engendrados né, recentemente para mudar a atuação do judiciário brasileiro e a gente conseguiu fazer essa contenção, eu acho que esse é o papel mais importante da associação que eu presido hoje, essa associação que tem 72 anos de história, mas a MB nunca foi tão chamada ao debate democrático como está sendo chamada agora. E a gente tem buscado apoio é, em outras instituições também para que essa, esse fortalecimento do judiciário seja completo. Então, sociedade civil organizada tem estado conosco, é, a, a OAB federal, a grande OAB né, é, no Brasil e tantas outras instituições que têm nos dado esse aporte né, de segurança para enfrentar esse momento em que as instituições estão sendo vergastadas exatamente pelo seu claro e firme posicionamento institucional. Com relação ao judiciário, a gente ainda tem uma, uma, um, uma questão que ela é o judiciário brasileiro que é maior, que é o fato de o, a justiça eleitoral ser conduzida por magistrados e ser conduzida por um magistrado do Supremo Tribunal Federal. Então, isso tudo gera né, uma, uma, uma complicação maior. Num momento em que o Brasil também já tem um desgaste muito grande institucional no judiciário, porque a política judicializou a política. 
Então, todas as grandes questões políticas brasileiras estão sendo decididas ou no Supremo Tribunal Federal ou no Tribunal Superior Eleitoral ou nos tribunais do país. Isso gera um estressamento e é óbvio que a gente vai sofrer né, as consequências institucionais desse posicionamento. Mas eu tenho é, bastante confiança de que nós estamos fortes, é, isso não é da boca para fora, né, porque eu estou falando aqui no Fórum Internacional, é porque realmente nós estamos conseguindo fazer com que as decisões proferidas, que são decisões bastante fortes né, nesse momento de enfrentamento ao, ao poder político, elas estão sendo cumpridas. E isso é o um sinal de que as nossas instituições é, estão fortes. A gente tem algumas pesquisas recentes, né, uma que foi conduzida pela própria MB, pelo ministro Luiz Felipe Salomão, que se chama Quem Somos a Magistratura que Queremos?, essa pesquisa indica que o grau de confiabilidade da população no judiciário é duas vezes superior ao grau de confiabilidade no legislativo e no executivo. Então, demonstra que nós estamos fazendo esse papel no check and balances é, adequadamente, o Poder Judiciário. E uma pesquisa recente também da Fundação Getúlio Vargas, eles têm um índice de avaliação do judiciário brasileiro, esse índice também apontou que entre os anos de 2017 e 2021, a gente teve, a população brasileira é, sentiu uma melhoria de confiança no Supremo Tribunal Federal, esse índice saiu de 24% para 42%, o que indica também que, embora a gente esteja no meio né, desse conflito, a população ainda procura o judiciário, ainda encontra no judiciário é, essa palavra final. E quanto a essa questão, finalmente, da independência judicial, também a população nesse mesmo índice, oito entre dez é, entrevistados, é, entendem que o Supremo Tribunal Federal não deve ser fechado né, ou desmantelado como algumas, algumas lideranças políticas no país têm, têm propagado. Então, isso indica que, apesar de tudo, nós estamos cumprindo o nosso papel constitucional e que a população tem confiado é nessa resposta que está sendo dada pelo Judiciário Brasileiro. Thank you, Renata. Uh, a reminder that we are conducting the conversation in English, but we do have um, interpretation available for everyone connecting via Zoom. Um, Bruno, I saw you nodding, and I wanted to turn it back to you, um, or turn it to you, because Renata mentioned something that is very key to the issue brief that we are launching today. She said that Brazilian institutions are strong, um, and this is something that we are also acknowledging, but that doesn't mean that they can't be strengthened and further strengthened. And that's the, the approach and the argument that we are taking on this issue brief that we are launching today. One of the key recommendations that we have from this issue brief is in, in institutionalizing norms that uh, to ensure the independence and balance of powers. And I know that we spoke about this uh, before as well in informing this policy in this issue brief. And I wanted to ask you about this. Um, we mentioned in this issue brief the PGR, for example, the Prosecutor General's Office and the, the TCCC lista triplice as one of the institutions that could be one of the norms that could be institutionalized and I wanted to ask you on what are some of the most uh, crucial unwritten rules that should be protected immediately and what effects will have will that have on Brazilian democracy in, in the foreseeable future okay thank you very much uh, Valentina for for your question thank you the Atlantic Council and also action for democracy for the invitation, and I want to congratulate you for all the work you've been doing in the defense of democracy in Brazil and, and across the globe. And, um, well, as we have seen in uh, several countries and uh, throughout history, uh, the cause, the anti-corruption cause and anti-corruption discourse is very often hijacked by populist authoritarian forces. And that's what happened here in our country. And uh, as soon as these uh, forces are successful reaching power, uh, one of the first things they do is precisely to dismantle uh, the anti-corruption legal and institutional frameworks, because these frameworks are also the mechanisms that limits 
their powers and, and uh, holds them accountable for their acts. So at the same time that uh, these groups, they destroy the anti-corruption instruments, they destroy the systems of checks and balances in, in the country. And uh, for the last four years, we have been documenting and denouncing the dismantle of uh, the main pillars of Brazil's checks and balances systems by the, the Bolsonaro administrations and its uh, allies in other powers, in the other branches of government. So beginning by the, the judicial pillar, uh, the pillar of account judicial accountability, this has been neutralized uh, in a large sense by the appointment of a prosecutor general that is absolutely aligned uh, with the government and the political class. Uh, but also moving to the political accountability pillar of the checks and balance system, uh, the neutralization of the Congress by mechanisms like the secret budget that basically reverted uh, all the Brazilian uh, public investment at the federal level to the hands of congressmen without any uh, system of transparency or accountability. Uh, and then the third pillar, the social accountability pillar, was attacked by reducing the access to information, to imposing secrecy to key uh, information for public interest, reducing the spaces of participation and threatening the work of civil society, the free media, etc. So I think uh, looking ahead, what we need to focus ahead is basically to rebuild uh, the pillars of our accountability system. So certainly to strengthen the judicial accountability pillar, we will need to uh, discuss the reestablishment of mechanisms that uh, secure the independence of the judiciary, but basically more focused the independence of the prosecutor general's office. Uh, we have had a successful experience with the triple list that uh, is voted by the peers of prosecutors, the National Association of, of Prosecutors, that to present this list to the government, and then the president can appoint and the Senate can uh, confirm the decision. This is a, 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 an important mechanism, but it's also insufficient. It's important to reestablish this practice, but there will be necessarily a debate on the accountability and the limits of the prosecutors themselves. Because uh, whoever comes to, to government, if it's uh, Bolsonaro again, uh, probably this debate will come, but very likely if Lula comes, this debate will be key. The limits of the prosecutor's office, because Lula uh, complains that he was target of uh, a political persecution by Lava Jato, the prosecutors, uh, they were acting beyond their limits, etc. So it's going to be very central, the debate uh, next year, what the mechanisms will be put in place to put limits in the actions of the, the prosecutors, to set accountability for their work. Uh, but we have basically two paths to, to pursue in this, uh, this goal. One is a very dangerous path, the path of uh, political control of the prosecutors. That will finish to, to, to end with uh, the independence of prosecutors. But we have an alternative path which is the democratic control of uh, prosecutors. And we have several uh, proposals to do that without strangling the independence of the prosecutors. Uh, second, moving to the political pillar of accountability, we need to focus on the extinction of the secret budget. And the ideal way to do that is the judiciary to take this role the Supreme Court to make a decision and clearly decide on the lack of constitutionality of these mechanisms. By doing that, they will uh, prevent uh, a likely Lula government to have to clash with the Congress right from the beginning of it, its administration. So ideally, we will see a decision by the new president of the Supreme Court to put this issue into voting. Uh, Rosa Weber is the rapporteur of this case. And she maintained uh, her, her role as the rapporteur of this case. And likely, we would like to see uh, that a decision by the Supreme Court to abolish the secret budget. And finally, to conclude, the social accountability pillar needs to be reconstructed 
by uh, re-establishment, re-establishing the access to information law, uh, the vigency of the, the access to information law, re-establishment of the institutional uh, spaces for participation, and the respect for the, the freedom of the press and the, the space for civil society and every critical voice uh, in the country. So it's basically a work of reconstructing uh, the pillars of our checks and balances systems beyond uh, the topic of corruption. Thank you, Bruno. I think that that's key and something for us to, um, as in the Atlantic Council in organizations like ours in SEBRI, like to look into as well in how we can be helpful in that effort. Um, you mentioned the voice of uh, the media, independent media as well as civil society organizations, but one of the things that we always here and, and we see that disinformation is actually a challenge for democracies worldwide. Um, the Atlantic Council, for example, has its own center focused on disinformation, the DFR Lab. And I wanted to ask you, Alana, about this and disinformation um, in this Brazilian elections. We saw it playing a big role in 2018, won a big role here in the United States in 2020, and again, playing a bigger role um, this year at the 2022 elections in Brazil. Um, we know that the Brazilian Supreme uh, Electoral Court has made, established many partnerships with social media companies to try and regulate the spread of disinformation around um, this election, uh, this electoral period. Um, and I wanted to ask you how successful they've been, how successful has, has this efforts been in you from the side of the, the social media platform, right, from YouTube, as well as Hedges Cordia is working directly with some of the um, influencers and in, in digital voices that we have in Brazil, what are new strategies that, what are some of the new strategies needed to make sure that we are curbing the, the level of disinformation? Thank you for your question, Valentina. Good afternoon to all my colleagues uh, that are live in DC, but also the ones that are seeing us uh, through the Zoom. Uh, it's a big pleasure to be here, and I really want to congratulate the Atlantic Council and the other organizations that participated for the work. Uh, a, dialogue, a dialogue like this is really important, especially having like multi-stakeholders to debate such challenging issues. But I really like, uh, and, and Valentina, thank you for bringing this question, because like you said, the TSC, the, TSC, the Supreme Electoral Court in Brazil, has been doing uh, great work on building this dialogue with, uh, with civil society organizations, but also with media platforms since 2014, when they started building the Fight Misinformation Program in partnership with all the social media platforms, including YouTube that I represent, but also with civil society organizations. And that added a lot of value to the work we have been doing on the ground. The program has been evolving in every election. I've been here since 2020, and I've seen how the program has been evolving, not only in Brazil, because we get lessons from Brazil, but also from other countries, other markets. We learn something, those lessons are learned, we bring to the table, we improve the program, including our participation. This information has moved from the marginal to the mainstream, and it seems that no topic has been immune to misinformation. We've, we've seen that with the challenge that we face with COVID-19 crisis. So uh, that that's why one of our uh, main goals, that's why uh, responsibility is to fight and stop mis the spread of misinformation. That's one of our deepest commitment at YouTube. So for the 2022 election, our goal is to remove fast content that violates our policies, but also to raise authoritative sources, such as the TSE itself in our platform and provide support to voters in, fi in finding reliable and useful information so they can make an informed choice when voting. But the partnership is with TSE is broader. We're, only, uh, we're also doing capacity building for the electoral court staff. We want to make sure, for example, that they knew how to use YouTube and how they can use the open platform and they, their voice to spread the message, spread misinformation. We also have been doing a lot of work with civil society organizations that are part of the program, including the observers from the electoral court, for them to learn our policies, learn our community guidelines. Uh, 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 Dr. Renata Gil and IMEV, for example, were here. Uh, two weeks ago at the YouTube office in Sao Paulo, their team to learn more about how to use YouTube as an open platform to also share more information. So we know that to fight misinformation, we need to make sure we're giving people more information. So we've been doing a lot on capacity building, trainings, 
and building that dialogue with all uh, the members of the Fighting Misinformation Program. And two other things that I would like to highlight on that program that I think it's really interesting and it's really important on that pillar of raising information is the panels we have been developing in partnership with the TSE. So we, we recently launched two panels uh, on the YouTube platform. When you look for information about uh, the election, you're gonna see in the watch page and in the video uh, itself, what we call the election integrity alert panel. It's gonna take users to the TSE website where they can learn more about the, electro, the integrity of the electoral process. We also have another panel that drives people to the TSE website for them to learn more about the electronic ballots itself. We know those are two topics that uh, have been under discussion that are subject to misinformation. And we believe that giving people more information, it's a really important tool to fight misinformation. Thank you, Elena. And it, this is also something else that I wanted to turn a little bit the conversation into this, is that this information, corruption, and other factors have played a role into how confident Brazilians feel in their democratic institutions and democracy as a whole. And Feliciano, I wanted to ask you about this because youth skepticism and lack of turnout has historically been an issue for Brazilian elections, even, even though in Brazil we have mandatory voting, we have a very high turnout of nulls and blanks, as well as not, not people, people not showing up, um, as well as lack of engagement beyond the electoral process. So I wanted to, to ask you of which policies or recommendations um, are most likely to re-engage young voters, as well as those voters that lack the confidence and the desire to actually be politically engaged um, in Brazil today, and why is that? You're muted again. <laughs> there you go. I'm sorry about that. I'm so used to the Zoom, and I still make this mistake every time. Two years later, so, I'm used to it. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> well, thank you, Valentina, for your question. I have a, a more positive view on the issue of turnout. Um, you mentioned that Brazil uh, has a 80% turnout in every election. That's a very, very high margin. If you look at the history of the Brazilian election since the... the the return to democracy in 1985, 1988, depending on how you calculate, uh, our turnout is very, very high. And that's, it is high because of the mandatory voting system, right? So some countries in the world, they had no mandatory voting. They, uh, they, they went to mandatory, the turnout went up, and then they came back to the no mandatory voting, and the turnout went, uh, went down uh, again. So I think the, the current legislation for Brazil, it's, uh, it's well thought and well designed. Because it is mandatory, the, major, the vast majority of the people go to the polls, they vote. Uh, the, the no's and the blanks votes are more in the legislative uh, voting than the, the executive. So they, 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 they are more accurate, they go more for presidents, mayors and governors than they do for senators, uh, uh, house deputies and state deputies. And there's a mandatory voting with a very low uh, penalty. For example, I spent three years in the U.S. and I, I missed one election. When I returned to Brazil, I had to, uh, to clear my uh, my voting record with the, in the electoral court. And I went there and I paid the fine. It was like two or three reais. Even if you don't have the money, you you, you can uh, forgo the penalty as well. So you have to have your voting record straight so you can uh, do a lot of uh, business in Brazil or work with the government or anything like that. So the system in Brazil, in terms of turnout, is ha, has been working well. There is the whole discussion if the, the 20% uh, 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 no voting, the 20% of people that don't go to vote, how we can work with them to go to vote. But I think with the current system, uh, we're doing well on, on this issue. But also the, the, the issue of young and how they, the, the youth and how they vote, right? If you, if you look at the, the news uh, recently, you'll see that the number of eight, 16 years old uh, who registered to vote broke all the records of the last elections in Brazil? It's mandatory voting after you, after you turn 18, but it's a, it's a, you can vote if you want from six, if you turn up from 16 to 18 years old. So the numbers of people registering to vote has gone up. My, I mean, there are a lot of hypotheses for that. My interpretation is the the, the Bolsonaro administration was uh, was so bad to the youth in Brazil that they had the the government itself, but by, by, by make its own mistakes, push the youth to to register more to vote, man. Right? Uh, but also, I think the, mo the most important hypothesis for that is how the, is the, the job well done by the electoral court in Brazil, by the TSE, the, 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 the National uh, Electoral Court, that made a tremendous job in terms of convincing the young to go to register to vote. So 
if there is any policy recommendation from this, I think Brazil is a role model in terms of uh, how push uh, pushing people to vote. Other countries that have no mandatory voting should consider mandatory voting. I'm much in favor of mandatory voting. I'm totally against no mandatory voting, especially for a country that is uh, as poor as Brazil. One of the key aspects of the positive side effects of mandatory voting is that you mandatorily include people into the policy making. Because if the if you, if you have mandatory voting, the, the poor predominantly go to vote, and you have as a candidate, as a as a politician, you have to target these people. You have to to give them back public goods in order to get their votes in the last election. So the mandatory voting is a very important uh, uh, instrument to include enfranchise people in Brazil to include them in the political decision. And when you, uh, and the issue of the of the youth and how they're voting in Brazil, I think is changing in Brazil. It's more and more people. Uh, this is one of the positive effects of having social media. So more and more people are engaged in uh, whether it's in fake news or not. They, they're discussing more uh, politics than before. So I'm from a different regener generation that didn't care much about politics because we, I, I, I turned age 16 right after the, uh, the dictatorship. So democracy was already given uh, and democracy seemed to be given. So since it was given to us, uh, we we'll, we'll never care much if it was working or not. I think this is changing with the current administration. So just to summarize, I think I have a more positive view on that. And I'm totally in favor of the Brazilian uh, mandatory system. And it should be strengthened and expanded worldwide. So thank you very much on this, for this question. <clears throat> thank you so much, Feliciano, for this positive outlook. Uh, I agree with that. Um, actually, you mentioned inclusivity of the mandatory voting system, and we actually received a question from Umberto Colado from IRI. And I wanted to ask a bit to Renata, Dr. Renata Gil, because um, we spoke about gender-based violence before. And one of the things that we see is that in Brazil, the majority of the electorate is actually female, it's women, um, but that's not reflected in politics in general. So what role can gender play in further strengthening democracy in Brazil? And what are some opportunities in Brazilian politics for them? I think that this also goes into the issue of uh, violence against uh, women in politics in general, if you could speak a little bit more to that and this new um, legislation that we have in place for these upcoming elections too. Bem, esse é meu tema preferido, né? Falar sobre inclusão, falar sobre gênero é, e tudo que tem acontecido no Brasil. Aliás, a gente está nesse momento discutindo uma violência que aconteceu, que não é uma violência política, mas em razão da política, uma jornalista brasileira foi agredida por um militante, por um deputado, e esse deputado já está, pelo que eu ouvi hoje na mídia, com oito processos de, de pedido né, de cassação do Conselho de Ética na, na Assembleia Legislativa. É, o fato é que nós, no Brasil, sofremos do mesmo mal que o mundo tem sofrido. Né? A violência de gênero ela também entra na violência é, política, ela também entra na política, a gente percebe que muitas mulheres sofrem violência política, e o Brasil acabou de disciplinar esse tema, a gente aprovou uma lei que criminaliza a violência política. Eu mesma, como presidente da AMB, essa associação gigantesca de juízes, eu estive em algumas diligências com o governo federal no interior da Bahia, no Recôncavo Baiano, em que uma prefeita é, teve seus dois correligionários assassinados brutalmente e, e ela ameaça, ameaçadíssima de morte, porque naquele local sempre houve uma eleição do coronelismo é, local masculino, então a gente vê muita dificuldade ainda nessa ascensão é, feminina, nessa inclusão, né? Como o Feliciano falou, eu acho que é, a inclusão ela só vai ser completa se nós tivermos os representantes e estivermos participando desse processo é, político. Não tem como você alijar um determinado segmento e é isso, isso vale para todos os outros, né? A, a população negra, o povo preto, todas as pessoas que precisam dessa representação. E o que nós temos visto é que quanto mais pessoas é, das minorias nas lideranças, quanto mais mulheres, por exemplo, eu que sou representante aí da, da, do, do grupo feminino, né? Quanto mais mulheres a gente coloca nos cargos de liderança mais decisões com perspectiva de gênero a gente tem, mais políticas de gênero a gente tem. Eu mesma apresentei como presidente da MB um pacote legislativo chamado pacote Basta, que foi aprovado em quatro meses 
em ambas as casas, na Câmara, no Senado, e sancionada em solenidade oficial pelo presidente da República, criminalizando a violência psicológica no Brasil, algo que estava lá mais de sete anos nas prateleiras do Congresso Nacional, e criando uma política pública nacional, que é a campanha Sinal Vermelho, aquele X vermelho que as mulheres apresentam, e com esse sinal elas são socorridas de qualquer tipo de violência em razão é, do gênero. Então, a gente tem uma endemia de violência no Brasil pelo gênero, né? o Brasil é o quinto país que mais mata mulheres no mundo, só fica atrás de Rússia, Guatemala, Venezuela, Honduras, países que não cumprem tratados de direitos humanos, então a nossa posição nesse ranking é mais vergonhosa ainda, mas a gente tem caminhado, tanto com a reforma da legislação, e aí só nesse ano nós tivemos mais de 140 projetos de lei aprovados com relação à pauta de gênero, dando mais densidade à Lei Maria da Penha, que é a nossa lei que foi oriunda de uma condenação internacional do Brasil pela Corte Interamericana de Direitos Humanos, mas também melhorando a condição de acesso, né, combatendo a violência política, como esse projeto que foi apresentado pela deputada Margarete Coelho, que acabou é, vencedor. Nós, como entidade da sociedade né, civil, nós... nós estamos propulsionando algumas políticas. Então, por exemplo, agora nós apresentamos ao TSE, quando da indicação é, da, 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 da ministra substituta, um pedido de lista tríplice só de mulheres, e o ministro Barroso acolheu isso quando o presidente do TSE e foi escolhida, então, a ministra Maria Cláudia, e isso foi né, uma movimentação que a gente tem feito. Eu tenho pedido que as listas de OAB, que as listas que têm sido apresentadas tanto nos tribunais eleitorais como nos tribunais de justiça, elas contemplem mulheres para que essa igualdade seja atingida e a gente tem, então, os exemplos que inibem a violência que tem sido praticada. Eu acho que não dependemos só das decisões judiciais afirmativas oriundas das ações judiciais afirmativas, nós precisamos, como sociedade, praticar essas ações afirmativas. E movimentos como esse, como pedido de lista tríplice, como é, colocação, pedidos de, de colocação de, de mais mulheres em cargos de liderança, passam uma mensagem para a sociedade de que as mulheres podem e devem ocupar né, os lugares e que elas promovam, então, é, as, as políticas públicas que vão trazer essa igualdade. Eu acho que quando nós tivermos uma perspectiva melhor de igualdade de gênero, nós teremos inexoravelmente uma perspectiva de diminuição da violência contra a mulher, levando em consideração que nós temos ainda né, a questão do pensamento patriarcal, isso é uma coisa que é estrutural né, e que precisa de políticas estruturantes para que a gente debele é, esse grande, grande mal. Mas eu tenho, como eu disse, eu sou otimista, eu tenho visto que o Brasil tem caminhado nessa direção da diminuição, ainda é uma diminuição muito simples, muito simplória, o último dado do Fórum Brasileiro de Segurança Pública indica uma diminuição de 1,7% dos feminicídios nesse ano de 2021, quando a gente implementou as políticas públicas como a Sinal Vermelho e algumas outras políticas públicas nacionais. Houve um aumento, no caso, nos, nos registros de, de, de ocorrência de violência contra a mulher, de 17% e um aumento de 12% nas medidas protetivas aplicadas. Então, isso também nos mostra que alguma coisa está funcionando, ainda não suficiente para a gente promover a igualdade de gênero e diminuir essa violência, tanto política como violência institucional que as mulheres têm sofrido. Obrigada, Renata. Thank you so much. Our, our time is almost up, unfortunately, because I have a list here of questions that I still wanted to cover and ask. But to wrap up, I think that Renata mentioned the gender issue, and I wanted to go back to each one of you and ask you in ask you for a brief comment on what are we are three weeks away from the first round of elections in Brazil happening in October 2nd on October 2nd um, what is one topic that you are watching and following closely and that you would suggest that we all do too um, I'll start with you Bruno of course I'm going to defend here my uh, my area of work and uh, uh, 
Of course, anti-corruption is uh, is key uh, for this moment here. Uh, some people say that this is not as important topic as it was uh, in 2018 elections, but uh, everyone that watched the first television debate, the presidential debate, saw that uh, the, the word corruption came up 43 times, 43 times. And uh, together with the uh, women, were two most debated uh, topics at the, at the presidential election. So I think uh, we need to see, uh, again, to restrain the, the, the fight against corruption, but in another approach, uh, an approach for what it truly means, a fight for rights. So it's, it's, it needs to be reshaped as a cause that uh, uh, respects and promotes rights and connected to other uh, very central issues to, uh, to the world today. For example, climate change. Uh, in Brazil, 98% of deforestation is illegal, is illegal deforestation. So fighting climate change in Brazil, it's a matter of rule of law. You know, poverty, inequality, security, all these issues are uh, deeply connected to the issues of rule of law, of fighting criminality, fighting corruption. So I think uh, what we need is um, to recover, to rescue the fight against corruption, but to give it another lens, you know, another approach, which is a rights uh, approach to the fight against corruption. Okay, so corruption and rule of law. Feliciano. Thank you, Valentina. I'm going to do just like Bruno did. I'm going to defend my ground here, and I'm sure Renata and Alana will do the same. So I think I'll be very happy to see the Atlantic Council organizing a with action for democracy, organizing a panel after the first, uh, the first round of elections about the future of Brazil's foreign policy, right, and the role of Brazil in the world. Right? Uh, the other day, I was talking to a foreign diplomat who was uh, asking me, say, oh, what did I, what did I th think about the election? Who was going to win? And I said, look, I think it's likely that Lula will win, but it's totally possible that Bolsonaro wins. So it's uh, it's impossible to predict. Somehow, uh, Lula has more chances, but Bolsonaro also has changed. And he was saying that in his continent, he was from Europe, he said everybody believes that Lula already won and uh, Brazil will be accepted again. Uh, as a, as a, a credible partner in world affairs. And I think it, this is obviously wrong. I think uh, the election uh, is uh, it's uncertain, especially because it's gonna, we're going to have a runoff. And, uh, and depending who will win and what type of foreign policy that person will implement in Brazil, that will shape our future uh, in terms of the world, the, 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 whole, the role of Brazil in the world for the, for the next uh, coming years. I think the the increasing rivalry between superpowers between the United States, China, and Russia, Brazil has to have a, a very sophisticated uh, foreign policy that prevents Brazil for, uh, from choosing sides in, the, the, in this coming uh, uh, rivalry. It will be very wrong for Brazil to choose one side or another. So, uh, and, and I think if Bolsonaro wins, uh, based on the, and the, and the, the four, years of it, four years of his administration, the foreign policy he implemented, Brazil might make a terrible mistake. Uh, so I think foreign policy and the and the role of Brazil in the world for the next 10 years should be a, a very important panel for the Atlantic Council to discuss <laughs> in the next, uh, right after the, the first round. Thank you very much, Valentina, and thank you again for the opportunity of speaking here. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet Renata, Bruno, and Alana uh, on this panel. Hope to see you and talk to you in the future, in Portuguese. In Portuguese. Thank you, Feliciano. So I invite everyone to continue following the work of the Atlantic Council because we have that coming. Um, Alana, next is you. <laughs> Thank you. So me and different teams are closely monitoring this information, working quickly to remove content that violates our policies and that could cause real world harm, such as violent extremism. And we'll stay vigilant ahead of, during and after the election day. So misinformation is my concern right now. Renata. Então, a minha preocupação é exatamente o fortalecimento do sistema judicial, independência judicial, é o desafio do mundo, depois do que fez El Salvador com os seus, com os seus é, magistrados, né? depois do que fez é, a Polônia, depois do que está tentando fazer Angola, com seus juízes também, é o meu desafio, e acho que a gente tem aí uma proteção institucional e constitucional potente para fazer valer essa independência judicial. Muito obrigada.
Obrigada, obrigada a todos, muito obrigada. Thank you, Bruno, thank you, Feliciano, thank you, Alana, thank you, Renata. I would say let's also keep watching the legislative elections as well as state-level elections, because we are electing not only president, but state-level representatives too, and uh, Congress, congressional representatives. With that, I invite all of you to join us and please read our issue brief um, that we just launched today. It's available on our website as well as you should have received a link um, on the Zoom chat as well. Thank you so much for joining us and for tuning in. Thank you to our speakers um, and have a good day.